Welcome back to Systematic Theology, Renewing Your Mind. Tonight is the Law of God, um, which I've subtitled The Constitution of the Covenant, which in fact it, it really is. And we talked in one of our previous segments about the covenant and that the covenant was God's chosen means by which he interacted with his people. And so we are his covenant community, new covenant community. In the Old Testament, circumcision was the sign of being inclusion in the covenant community, and baptism is a sign of inclusion into the New Testament covenant community. But according to um, the Word of God, the Law of God, or the Bible, is the Constitution of the covenant or the covenant community of God. Just as America has a constitution, um, the highest law of the land, so of course the Bible, the law in its most general sense, is um, our constitution. Uh, we are ruled by law, um, theonomy. Now, by that I don't mean, I'm not a theonomist, but just that we are ruled by God. Now, in this discussion of the law of God, which is a very important part in our discussion of the word of God, there are two equal and opposite errors that we need to avoid, and that's antinomian, antinomianism and legalism. We discussed antinomianism in our session on the carnal Christian, but just to, to go over that real uh, quickly, antinomianism is against lawism, and it's just the heresy of thinking of uh, hyper grace. Uh, it goes all the way back to people misunderstanding Paul's teaching. Uh, he taught grace so strongly that folks even back then understood, misunderstood his teaching, that um, uh, they didn't understand that uh, um, if you were truly born again, then it would entail um, repentance and a inner change by the Holy Spirit, and um, then the opposite error is legalism, and the um, we know that Jesus is most uh, ferocious. <laughs> um, debates were with the Pharisees regarding this issue. Um, they had they were under the assumption that you could be saved by the um, keeping of the law, and um, so. That's the primary definition of legalism, is, is believing that you could be saved legally by the law. Um, some other variants of it is elevating tradition to the same level as um, the Word of God and the Gospel, and as necessary uh, for salvation. Um, majoring on minors, minoring on majors, that type of thing. Um, and then, moving on from there, um, the Reformers, both Calvin and Luther, um, looking at Scripture, uh, saw that there were three uses of the law of God. And... Um, I think it's a great summary of what the Bible as a whole teaches about um, the law of God. Remember, systematic theology asks, what does the whole of the Bible say about a particular subject? And tonight it's the law of God. The first use of a law is like a mirror. And in this mirror, we see the holiness of God, which then reveals our sinfulness. And it causes a sinner to be terrorized and to push them to the gospel and to Jesus. So the first use of the law is to terrorize um, the, the sinner to seek a savior. 
You, you first have to know that you're a sinner in order to, to uh, seek a Savior, to seek a gospel. Second use of the law is that of um, uh, informing society with um, just laws. Um, people can't be saved through law, but in order to have a civil society like our own, um, believe it or not, Western culture is very much built on the Ten Commandments and other laws and found in the Bible. So the second use of the law would be a means of uh, bringing uh, justice to society. The third use of the law and as many people think it's the highest, and that is, um, it's a guide for sanctification. I know many people talk about, you know, the law of Christ, and all we have to do is just love God and our neighbors, and that's all we have to do. But, you know, in the New Testament, there is 1,050 laws. I don't know if you knew that or not, but um, why would so many laws be given uh, to us uh, unless we needed them in order to flesh out this idea of, of loving God and our neighbor because really those can be amorphous terms particularly in our day. So um, the third use of the law uh, the, it helps us to understand more, more fully how to please God. Uh, that might be a, a better way to put it. And in this regard, there's plenty of grace in the Old Testament, and there's plenty of law in the New Testament. As I just alluded to, there's, um, if you can look it up, there's 1,050 laws in, uh, in the New Testament. And folks complained about the 600-some in the Mosaic law. law. So um, it was Luther had so many keen insights and uh, one of the important things that a theologian does is make distinctions um, but in this case I think he made he went a little bit too far in, in making distinctions between law and gospel and um, he didn't want any law with the gospel at all and um, he wanted to keep them really separate but really truly if you look at the Bible carefully the gospel itself contains law. Think about it. Uh, the gospel commands people to repent and to believe. That's law. You know, Acts 2.38, etc., etc. So you can't, you know, you can't just put a total wall between the two. The law does... There is a distinction between law and gospel, no, no question about that. Um, but, uh, you know, there is, in this discussion, though, there were several months ago I had, I sent out a letter to Christians in the paranormal community, right? Some of you may know about that. And uh, it was an unprecedented thing, and it challenged people to stop doing what they've been doing, and that's investigating because they were disobeying God's law and I found out that the main people main way that people were getting around that challenge were they replied that well the Old Testament law doesn't apply to them anymore well yes it does um, and I found that uh, really the, the most helpful way to discuss the New Testament believers relationship to the Old Testament law is not so much the New Testament's discussion of the law but rather what the New Testament says about the inspiration and authority of the Bible in general but in particular the Old Testament and the reason I say that is because so many of the discussion well there's so many different meanings of law in the Bible and then secondly so many of the discussions of law in the New Testament are in the context of some controversy. Um, for example, um, people thinking that they can be saved by the law. Now, in a context like that, there might be the at least the appearance of a dim view of the law based on 
that context. So even even between Romans 7 and 8, there seems to be a conflicting, um, not opinion, but it just, there's a flow uh, depending upon Paul's emphasis on which aspect of the law he's talking about. So I have personally have found it more helpful to look at what Jesus and the apostles said about the word itself. So let's let's do that, okay? We're first going to look at um, Jesus, then at what uh, Peter says, and then what Paul says, and we'll move from there to see what the... Um, because the question I want to raise at this point is, specifically, what is the Old Testament's um, role, uh, Old Testament law? And I think when I say that, I'm thinking specifically the Mosaic law. What, if any, um, relevance does it have for believers today? Or do we just totally throw it out? Um so let's let's look at that, and in um, in that regard, this is biblical theology. <laughs> so in Matthew chapter five, this is an important. Uh, let, me, let me stop for a second because this is at the very beginning of Jesus's public ministry. All right, he's beginning his Sermon on the Mount, and it's. Um, the placement of of this chapter 5 or 17 and following it's as if he's saying okay everything else that, that comes after this needs to be understood through the lenses of what I'm saying right here um, because he, he touches on a lot of things and corrects a lot of different misinterpretations and interpretations of the Old Testament but uh, it's important that we note that this section is here for a reason, and it is um, it's, a, it's here as an interpret as an interpretive guide for the rest, not only the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, but for the rest of everything that Jesus says. So, having said that, let's let's read what. Our Lord says, starting at verse 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Now, the law would have been the Pentateuch in this regard. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, in light of this text, the burden of proof um, rests on the shoulders of those who would jettison any aspect of the Old Testament as far as it being authoritative for today in some sense. Now, we're going to talk in a moment about, of course, there's certain things. Common sense is going to tell us that the ceremonial law has been fulfilled, as Jesus alluded to, the dietary, in fact, has been explicitly abolished. Um, the dietary laws have been abolished in the New Testament, explicitly. Okay, circumcision explicitly abolished, as far as the necessity of it. Um, and is the things that have to do with Israel as a nation um, have been implicitly or explicitly uh, denied as a need for the church because we are now the new Israel. And we'll talk about it in another segment. But um, the point being is that Jesus is saying at the very outset of his, his teaching that he's making it very plain that, yes, he fulfills all of the Old Testament, but then he does tell us 
you know, what his view of the Old Testament is. And it's a very high view. And so for a person to even think about jettisoning um, part of the Old Testament, that would be out of line with what Jesus himself was just saying there uh, about the uh, um, applicability. Every inch, if I could paraphrase Jesus, he's saying every inch of the Old Testament is applicable today in some sense, in some sense. Um, that's the key phrase. Now, uh, if you turn to First Peter, the interesting thing about the two passages I'm going to be reading from Peter and Timothy, uh, from Paul and Timothy, is that in both contexts, these men are about to die. So it's, it's pretty touching. Um, Peter says in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 13, I think it right as long as I am in this body to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able to, at any time to recall these things. And then he goes on to talk about that we didn't hit, follow cleverly devised myths. And he talks about the um, transfiguration. And in the classic text of verse 19, and we have something more sure, even more sure than his the event that he witnessed, the prophetic word to you, which you will do well to pay attention to as to a, a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Jesus second coming. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for pro no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now here you have Peter, who's on the verge of being uh, of dying, and he is very earnest about preparing the church for that, that event. And so one of the things that he appeals to is to remind the church of the singular authority and inspiration of the Old Testament. Of course, that's what he's talking about. No prophecy was produced by man, but people carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's a very strong view of inspiration. And again, of course, he does refer to Paul later on in this text is, is his writings as being scripture, but at this point in church history, the main scriptures were the Old Testament um, because the New Testament was just beginning to be formed. And exactly the, the same phenomenon in Second Peter, uh, we see Paul in um, first, excuse me, Second Timothy, Chapter 4, verse 6, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Uh, yeah, this is these two old Jewish men, Messianic Jews, I guess. Um, two of my heroes, uh, yours too to the greatest giants of the Christian faith, Peter and Paul, both about to die, both appealing, as we'll see, as trying to um, prepare the church for their uh, imminent departure, both of them appealing to the strong authority of the Old Testament. This is where we have Paul's classic text, several verses up, chapter 3. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Now keep in mind again, this very strong statement about the authority of scripture is primarily a reference to the Old Testament, okay? And the first generation of Christians 
it was the Old Testament was their Bible for the most part. You had some circulating letters from the apostles, but it was primarily the Old Testament. And so you have Paul speaking about that there. And again, it's, it's, it's pretty existentially, in a sense, touching situation because for both men, they, they were on the verge of death. And they just instinctively knew that they wanted to highlight how inspired, as Jesus appealed to at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, basically saying the same thing. You know, don't mess with it. This is God's Word. All of it since inspired. So, um, again, I would say the burden of proof definitely lies on, if you're going to toss stuff out of and say that it's not applicable today in any way, then the burden of proof lies on, on your shoulders. Um, unless it's explicitly um, stated in New Testament, we need to understand from Jesus' words, Paul's words, and Peter's words, that unless it's explicitly stated in the New Testament, we need to uh, understand that uh, the moral law of God is still applicable today um, explicitly, but that all of the Old Testament, whether it be ceremonial or um, that having to, to do with it as a nation, there's still a, a um, general uh, meaning that we can get. I mean, if all of Scripture, all of it, even the ceremonial law, if all of that's inspired, and we know that it is, then there's some sense in which it's applicable today. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. In fact, let me bring that out by way of a syllogism. I haven't read this anywhere. Uh, this is one where I just kind of came out of my own crazy head. Uh, think of it in this way, all right? This is Hunterman's, Hunterman's syllogism uh, in defense of um, Mosaic authority, all right? All right, um, a syllogism has three parts. You have the major premise, minor premise, conclusion. So the major premise is this, is what I just read. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. I trust you agree with that. The second premise or minor premise is the Mosaic law, 600 some laws, is part of scripture. It's part of all of scripture. Okay, Verse 16 says all scripture is inspired by God. My second point is that Mosaic law is part of all of scripture. Therefore, conclusion, the Mosaic Law is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. It follows. It's both valid and sound. So, if we believe, truly believe what Paul is saying here, that all Pontos Scripture is breathed out by God, then that means all Scripture is breathed out by God. And it is um, clear, it is uh, uh, applicable, um, it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that we would be confident and equipped for every good work. The more, um, who are we? Who do we think we are to throw out certain parts of Scripture? Hmm. I, I, I really don't understand it. Um, again, that's how people got out from underneath my challenge to them because it came from Deuteronomy chapter 18. They didn't realize that in that same chapter, there is a prophecy of, um, well, the first part had to do with prohibitions about uh, invalid forms of seeking supernatural knowledge. And the second half of Deuteronomy 18 had to do with valid means of 
the seeking supernatural knowledge to God's prophets. And in that context, you have the prophecy of the Lord Jesus, which is quoted in the New Testament about Jesus as the, um, the prophet, Jesus' prophet, priest, and king. The prophet, priest, and king. So I hope you followed my reasoning in the syllogism. Um, it, it's just really, it's just common. It boils down to common sense. Am I talking about how that we should apply, like the theonomists say, and the more stricter ones that we need to apply all of the law? No, not, absolutely not. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is what Jesus said. Jesus, as you know, after he uttered that point in Matthew 5, 17 and following, after that he made a distinction between the literal meaning of the Ten Commandments and then its wider meaning, like, for example, murder and anger. That was a wider general application of it. Same thing had to do with adultery. Just because somebody didn't commit adultery didn't mean that they... Um, that they were not guilty of its wider meaning or application, and that was lusting. So that's my point, is that though the literal application of these laws has been done away with, specifically things like dietary laws, um, laws having to do with circumcision and Israel as specifically as a nation, um, like circumcision, and, and then, of course, the, the um, laws having to do with uh, sacrifices, that those literally do, do not apply because we've, I mean, they were fulfilled in Jesus, and then we've been, ex they were explicitly um, annulled in the New Testament, we were told. The, the literal meanings were but the general meanings um what was underlying lying it there's still things that we can learn from it or we think of what th just think of what happens if we say there's no if there's no meaning whatsoever to the teaching about uh the dietary laws if there's no application whatsoever when it comes to the ceremonial law, then why read it at all? Why don't we just throw it out? What's the purpose in even reading the first five books of the Bible if there's no application or meaning of it at all? Okay, we all agree that that it's literally um, praise God is has been fulfilled in in the Lord Jesus. But there's a wider question, and this is just common sense. Is it just because it's been fulfilled or done away with the dietary laws? Uh, does does that and the laws having pertaining to Israel as a nation? Does that mean that there is then no application whatsoever that we can learn from it? This is this is inspired word of God. And I've used this before, but one of the laws it talked about was a parapet around the house. This has to do with the law of you know, Israel as a nation. Um, you know, parapet, it was like a railing, because during that time, people lived on the top of the houses. You know, that's not literally applicable today, but is there, is there something when we read that, can we apply that today? Sure. What it had, the underlying general meaning that we can learn from that is the sanctity of human life as it has to do with um, our households and how we con it's constructed. So for example, if you how you could apply that would be if you, if you have a pool, make sure you have a, a fence around it. Um, Paul himself, you know, in Deuteronomy 25, right in the middle of discussing leveret marriage, and um, an eye for an eye type application. I mean, we're talking really explicit Old Testament law stuff. Right in the middle, it says, don't muzzle an ox, you know, while it's um, eating or doing its threshing thing. Um, 
you know, it seems like well, what kind of meaning can you get, get out of that? Well, Paul found it, 1 Corinthians 9 9. He finds meaning in that and saying, Pay your pastor. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Is it, yeah, the literal meaning is, is done away with. You know, we don't have agricultural situation. We're no longer a nation uh, under, un, under God in that sense. And, but Paul could see that there was an underlying principle, underlying principle under that inspired word of God. And that's, that's all I'm saying is that most of these 600 laws is, is, are, are just principles for living like that. Uh, most of it is just teaching us, uh, a lot of it's just the same thing. It's just, you know, how to to just um, common sense type things like um, treating people with dignity. And it's, I mean, you know, the, it was the Old Testament itself that summarized itself by saying um, in Deuteronomy, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But um, it went on to give all these other laws because it needed to be fleshed out and we need to have it fleshed out because just loving God and loving our neighbor, that's an empty statement unless we know specifically what that means and what specifically, what specific activities please God or displease him. Um, that's where the law comes in handy. And um, let's take an area where we know, okay, it even says in Hebrews that in one sense that the law is obsolete. Yes, it is. Thanks, thank God, praise God it is. And especially with reference to the sacrificial system. But if you're reading Leviticus chapters 1 through 5, Okay, using this as an example, and just to close out our discussion. In Leviticus 1 through 5, you have the discussion of a burnt offering, a grain offering, peace offering, sin offering, and guilt offering. Now, lit literally, there's no applicability whatsoever. None. Be and praise God again for that, because Christ is the once for all sacrifice. But. Does that mean that we don't ever read Leviticus 1 through 5? God forbid. It says all scriptures inspired by God. That means Leviticus 1 through 5 as well. So what do we learn from Leviticus 1 through 5? Well, if you study the various five main sacrifices of the Old Testament, then each one of those will shed light on a various aspect of the multifaceted atonement of Christ. See what I'm saying? For example, the burnt offering, that focuses on the notion of propitiation more than any other um, aspect or any other um, offering would. And that's at the heart of the atonement, where God's wrath is poured out. Then you have the peace offering. What's it say in Romans 5.1? Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Um, you have the sin offering. Obviously, Jesus died for our sins. And then the guilt. We have objective guilt before God. We feel guilty because we have objective guilt. But a more in-depth study of these, which I don't have time to do, would bring this out. So, all uh, again, try to summarize. I um, guess I've been rambling a little, a little bit, but my point is, is just a simple plea for a common sense understanding of the Old Testament law and how every inch of it, because it's inspired, means that in some sense it's still applicable today. If only in teaching us, if only about the cross, enriching our understanding of the cross, or in a sense about the ox, understanding of the pastor.
There's a lot of rich things that if we take the time to read what we have tended to reject, there's a lot of beautiful things that we can find in uh, God's inspired word uh, in the Pentateuch. Because um, it touched on, on virtually every area of life. So that's my plea is to let's celebrate the law of God. And that it's out of gratitude for God's amazing grace that we want to obey God's law. You know, the giving of God's law in Exodus 20 is couched in grace. It says, it's, God said, because I have brought you out of the bondage of Egypt. Hence, here are my Ten Commandments. And then in the greater Exodus, which the Lord Jesus led us out, um, in the Old Testament and New Testament, we have salvation by grace through faith alone. But the law of God is, was and is the constitution of God's covenant community. And we obey it, not to please God, but praise God, he loves us and he's given us his law. And we obey it out of gratitude for our salvation by grace. Now, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that in your kindness and love, you have given us your law. And that you are a God of law. And we know that in the end of end times, that the lawless one will come. And it's instructive. He's called the lawless one because he's the antithesis of who you are in your covenant community. So may we learn to love your law as Psalm 119 teaches us to. And we pray in the name of Jesus who lived the law perfectly. Amen.